Hello folks, I'm Colonel Failure and this is Train Fever, and uh, this looks familiar, doesn't it? Um, yeah, so uh, here we are again, and, uh, and we're on the verge of bankruptcy once again. What the hell went wrong? Um, okay, right, let's, let's break this down in a simplistic fashion. One of the strengths of playing on the big map, the, so the largest map that you can do, is uh, is the number of vehicles, routes, lines, things that you get to play with, right? So, uh, you know, you've got dozens of towns to, to play with, and um, you can make a profit in every one of those towns. So when you start out, you do just that, and you set up... Uh, you know, good routes that are going to make a fair chunk of change out of each town. The problem comes in when those vehicles need upgrading. If you've got 100, 200 vehicles that all need upgrading at the same time, uh, you won't be able to afford it. It doesn't matter how much profit they're making, uh, because you'll have spent it. You'll have, you'll have spent that money on, you know, aggressive expansion and before you know it, you are unable to uh, to make the necessary upgrades to keep those vehicles functioning. Which means that the cost of those vehicles starts spiralling. And when those costs start spiralling, you get into, uh, you get, un you come unstuck really, really fast. Uh, I mean, if we look at the number of vehicles here that uh, are past their, their kind of 30 year best before date, they're all road vehicles at the moment. Which, I mean, they're not tremendously expensive to replace. They're like a couple of hundred thousand to throw. Um, but uh, the, the upshot is that that starts eating into your profit margin on those lines. Uh, but, uh, but because you're not building up the weight of cash behind yourself, you can't replace the really expensive beasts, the trains. Um, so if we go to balance here, as you can see, these four trains here are all costing us money and they are costing us more money than any of the road vehicles um and that's that's hellish um it's a, it you've uh, you've set yourself up for a massive failure don't get me wrong trains are also responsible for making me the most money um and part of the problem is down to loops uh loops are are tricky now here's a here's a kind of a theoretic uh, a theoretical notion for you to to chew on if I take a train round a loop, uh, and it takes, let's say, it takes the the kind of the, the twenty minute uh, game, the game twenty minute maximum. Let's uh, let's bring one up here. So both the full and the reverse are currently running the loop in in around a twenty minute window. What happens when uh, when you do this is that the passengers, you you've kind of just tipped into where passengers will actually want to use that loop. Okay, that's good. So you put more trains on the loop and uh, and passenger demand increases. This is still, you know, absolutely fine. The downside is that if you think of where you're dropping your passengers off. So let's say I'm going let's uh let's come up with a uh, uh an easy to illustrate example here. Kill all of this lot off. I I'm paused again simply because I don't want to go bankrupt while explaining this. Uh right. Let's say Bexley over here and Neston. Now they are on the same loop, right? So a train coming out of uh, out of Maryport comes into Neston, picks up whatever's waiting, heads to Bexley, picks up whatever's waiting, drops off people who want to go to Bexley. Right now, in a if you if I was instead instead of looping rounds, you know, people I picked up from Neston who wanted to go to Lisgard, which is the next station on the loop. Here we go. Uh, would stay on the train. So you don't get 100% of, uh, of the people on that train. This is where the money comes up short, right? First off, you've got some seats being blocked by people that want to go two stations up the row. Secondly, what you don't get is people getting on at Neston, then getting off at Bexley in order to catch another train from Bexley to Lisgard. Effectively, those passengers you could double dip from. Not everybody who gets off the train, that's their final destination. They want to go one further. So by running a loop uh, where every train runs the, uh, the, the entirety of the loop, you're actually costing yourself money. Um, having a looped track, absolutely fine. But what you want to be doing with it is, uh, is running services up and down in between each station or maybe a couple of stations at a time. 
This is a theory at the moment, but I'm going to try it out. Fortunately, I have a save. If you remember, I upgraded a station in the in the last game, uh, in the, the the last episode, or maybe the episode before that. Um, I upgraded the station. Fortunately, I put a save in at that point. Uh, so I'm going to uh, resume from there and uh, and see what I can do. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm still pointing the finger squarely at uh, at the 442. Uh, that did not help my uh, my my balance in the slightest. Equally, uh, the spacing of trains was terrible. Um, there were too many trains that were following so close to the, the the preceding one that they never got above kind of you know 15, 20 passengers on board. So they were never going to make me any money. Whereas the first train in the run was quite happily picking up a full load of 100 plus people and uh, and making good cash but those two together weren't offsetting each other so in trying to uh, in trying to make this efficient by using loops what i've actually done to myself is uh, is carved my profit to tiny tiny little pieces and uh, and the upshot is that i'm going to on a regular basis run out of cash that coupled with 150 hungry road vehicles all looking for an upgrade on a regular basis, and uh, I'm hosed. Uh, you know, it's it's almost at the point where I might not be able to recover from this. I'm going to have to repeatedly go back and uh, and and fix problems that, that manifest later. So uh, where are we? We're in 1971, and I just want to show you one more thing before I go fix everything. He said confidently said um where are we i need to find out there okay okay so we've got the road depot here 1971 available we have the peterbilt which can carry 18 of anything with a top speed that is admirable now this means that uh, i mean at the moment i'm running a mixture of the fords which can carry nine and studebakers that can carry 13. uh the fords all need upgrading uh and the studebakers have been you know, they're available from when? 45? Yeah, well, uh, by the time I'm going to get round to having all of those replaced, <laughs> there's no point in, uh, there's no point in doing anything but, you know, hanging on and, and looking up for the Peterbilt. If we bring up the, the vehicle list again. Uh, let's have a look. It's not actually telling me which vehicle. I don't know. Hold on. Let's the routes will show me the vehicles. Right. So if we look at, uh, you know, here's a perfect example in the middle. Skeleton Goods uh, is running two Fords, uh, probably both of which are overdue to be replaced, and one Studebaker, which will have been replaced in the last five years. Um, and, uh, you know, had I just held on, I could have been using these, uh, these full-on trucks instead, which would have allowed me to... Uh, make more profit with fewer vehicles and that would future proof me from uh, from going belly up further down the line through having to upgrade so many vehicles equally these coaches they're lovely uh, carry 12 passengers but I can't help but think maybe I should ditch my interior um, passenger routes and replace them with trams um, largely because uh, you know the running cost of trams isn't uh, you know is is relatively negligible i mean there's there's not much to call between trams and uh and buses in terms of general service but i think tram running costs are relatively lower uh, or at least their their service lifespan is longer um so yeah so there we go that's the uh, that's the plan now if we look at uh the trains that are available and I apologise already for this being a, a more theoretical episode than a than a practical one. Uh, let's have a look. So we've got uh, the New Mexico, which is there for from 1970. As it's a, I mean, it's a good train list. <laughs> There's no two ways about that. Um, but also recently introduced was the Metro Liner. 200 kilometres an hour carries 81 passengers. 40 years running costs of 900 grand a year exactly the same as i'm paying now uh and those are electric and i've not electrified anything and as you know placing electrification or upgrading your track in any way is uh is hellish if uh if you decide to do it later on rather than at point of purchase and frankly 81 passengers is probably a good sweet spot for um 
uh, for my kind of max carriages. Having trains that can carry 140, oh, that's fabulous for that train, but what about the one following it? You've basically eaten, you know, 40, 60 passengers that could be going on another service. Okay, so I'm now going to go back. I'm going to go and fix everything as much as possible, and then I'll walk you through it. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome back. Well, I'm paused, but you'll see the reason for that in a moment. Um, so, uh, we're now back to de December 1969, and, uh, and that's around uh, 10, maybe 12 years ahead of where I had to go back to. Uh, what I'm going to do this week is, uh, in this week's basic training, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go through in depth of exactly what I did to uh, to resolve the significant problems that the network had, um, and uh, and all being well, that will uh, that will make plenty of sense. Um, so as you can see, uh, we're running a metro liner here. We're uh, we're following the Holsworthy Loop. And both the loop and the anti-loop are running metro liners now, which means that I spent time electrifying the whole thing. All told, I probably spent between three and four hours fixing the problems. Uh, you might say, well, that's a little extreme. Well, yes, it is. Um, but uh, with extreme problems uh, come the need for fairly extreme solutions. So uh, I'm pretty happy now that, uh, that the problems are resolved, at least in the short term. The... The, the the fundamental is down to the map size. Um, by playing on a large map, you have that many more towns to deal with. On the one hand, where, hey, that gives us so many more opportunities to make some profit. On the other hand, it also uh, offers you a significant number of opportunities to make a hell of a lot of loss. And that loss, excuse me while I do a little upgrading at the same time, uh, and that loss is going to manifest itself through... Uh, oh, go on, upgrade. Oh, there, there's the upgrade button. Um, that loss manifests itself through uh, the... Uh, go on. Huh, that one did it just by me pressing the button enough times. Um... Seriously, I've got to finish this sentence. That loss manifests itself through the number of vehicles you have. So here's my full vehicle list. And it's a heck of a lot shinier than it was before, I tell you that for nothing. Um, but uh, but yeah, look at the, the quantity we're talking about here. Uh, what's the highest number we've seen? In fact, let's go for the name, and then we should be able to find the highest number. 163. So I think I topped out around the, you know, the 163, 165 mark uh, on road vehicles. Out, oh, that's great while they're all making money. And the problem comes from the fact of while they're shiny and new, they cost you very little to run. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, trucks and buses and what have you don't cost you an awful lot to run anyway. But while they're brand new, they cost you, you know, precious little to actually run. Um, but they all get older. And uh, let's say, for example, you've got a hundred vehicles, a mixture of trains and road vehicles and trams and the rest of it. And uh, and to start with, well, while they're new, they cost you a uh, hundred bucks a pop to keep running. So that's cost you, what, that's cost you 10,000 a year to pay all that maintenance. I mean, I'm using hypothetical figures. Now... With each passing year, that number effectively, you know, you uh, you add another, uh, you, you know, you could double it, you could add, uh, you could make it a thousand a year, and before you know it, what was ten thousand a year is starting to become a hundred thousand, a million, ten million a year. Now that's an extreme example, but uh, if you deplete your balance sufficiently when it comes time to actually replace your vehicles, um, before you know it, you will have. Uh, a scenario where firstly the amount that they're costing you to maintain is outweighing the amount they're bringing in and secondly and more importantly you haven't got any money to replace those vehicles so what were profitable routes may still be serving the same number of people may still be carrying the same amount of cargo but the costs associated now are at now mean that you have no chance of making a difference. So I've fixed this in a couple of ways. The the primary one of which, if I call up the right sheet, I'm going to show you that one in a minute. That's my kind of punchline there. Um, the primary one of which is on road. So previously, raw materials, we had four 
uh, or five vehicles carrying raw materials to be processed. So, you know, coal, iron, uh, lumber, oil uh, to be processed. Now, what that was fine while we were working with horses and carts. No problem there at all. Uh, because they were so slow and carried so little that they could easily offset their uh, their costs by by carrying relatively few items while at the same time making those facilities generate more and more money. Great. What I never did was I never cut back after we had expanded. Now, when I recovered from the previous uh, financial meltdown, one of the things I did was cut back a little. This time around, I've cut back a lot, and there's now a hard and fast rule. Three vehicles, raw materials, two vehicles, finished goods, because there's always some finished goods that end up just going their own way. Equally, I have turned off the automatic upgrade, because I know that there's a new goods vehicle coming very soon, and what I don't want is replacement vehicles turning up now, uh, and potentially lasting for 20 years, where they'll be slowing down the, uh, the bigger and more effective units that are coming in. We are still running some steam, uh, not for long. Uh, we're, we're in a position now to, to expand more safely. So, uh, yeah, so the other thing that I was doing was an over-provision of uh, uh, capacity, uh, particularly on trains. I, would, I was offering too much opportunity for people to just jump on a train and have a, an entire car to themselves. Um, not anymore, I've cut back. So all of these Metro Liners have a top capacity of 81, and I've actually spaced them out far better. So this guy's coming in now with 53 on board. I'll unpause in a sec. I just let me get through all this preamble stuff. Um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and more often than not, it's running at capacity. And the same is true on the reverse. I'm running three trains in each direction, and uh, as you can see from the... Uh, the, the route evaluation, both very profitable. Um, the, you know, the other train routes are also, you know, they're making a bit of cash. Maryloft, not so much, but uh, but he's due for a replacement. So, uh, so having a train that could support 144 passengers, well, glorious if that train ever filled up and then dropped off. No, uh, you don't want to do that because you're just hurting the other services. So you think, well, I'll get rid of the other services. At which point your frequency rate starts to increase and fewer people use the service in the first place. All of these things interlink. Uh, other efficiencies that I've done, I've deleted a few depots. Um, I've cut back on the number of vehicles. But fundamentally, it was, uh, it was aging, an aging fleet moving slowly that was causing me most of the problem, and my aging fleet were too numerous. Far, far too numerous. So I've cut my costs and increased my profit at the same time. Here we go, payday. Here is the company finance sheet. Uh, so back in uh, 1967 is when I introduced the Metro liners in full. I'd done a little bit the year before, but completed it, uh, as you can see, spent 10 million on uh, yeah spent spent 10 million on, on new trains I did sell the old ones and made well what do we make back there three and a half million back again so it wasn't 10 million out um, but as you can see you know the year that they bedded in they did 29.6 million in revenue and when you consider that we've we've halved the number of vehicles on the road their numbers are going up as well so all in all, jolly profitable. Last year, nine million in profit. This year, eight million in profit. We've still got four good days to go. Let's unpause. So I've been following around train two just to make sure that I've got my passenger spread kind of spot on. He's gonna come in as the year ends, which is why I wanted to stop at this moment because the new truck is available. So I'm going to go and put those into service forthwith. And I'll show you a little trick that I picked up from uh, a guy called Monty Rico, who, if you're not familiar with his uh, channel, well worth checking out. If you like train fever videos, he's doing it all the time. In fact, he plays exactly the same stuff as me, uh, but, you know, he's got a North American accent, I've got an English accent, where, you know, two peas in a pod effectively in a, in a gaming sense by all means check out his channel uh, right so let's uh, no wrong button let's get the right button there we go you want that one so let's get some trucks in service uh, let's pick one to focus on here we go now this is a trick that uh, that Monty uses 
And if we pause just before this guy stops, it will, it will, uh, it will behoove us. So you keep automatic vehicle replacement off so that uh, you're only replacing when there's a you know, when there's a reason to do so. The reason in this case, not that the vehicles are old necessarily, but there's a new one available. So we're going to set this to be the Peterbilt. Uh, just for reference purposes, the Studebaker can carry 13, the Peterbilt can carry 18. It will adequately, adequately replace the, uh, the lost vehicles that were running on these routes. Not to mention the fact it's faster. So we replace it for the Peterbilt. And these vehicles might not need replacing right now. I imagine they've got a few years left in them. Not if you set the vehicle age to 25%. There we go. So we've now told that one to go ahead. If we unpause, we'll watch this, uh, this lumbering old truck. Hopefully, there we go. Replace itself with this glorious new articulated beast. And the other two on the line will do exactly the same thing as soon as they hit uh, a stop. So you want to do this hands very much on. Uh, if <laughs> you, you don't want to go and go like, yep, I'll set all that up and then walk away because I've set it at 25%. We don't want these guys replacing at 25%. That would be bad. Let's, uh, let's speed things up just a smidge. There we go. There's the second one done. So these are faster and they carry more, uh, which uh, in turn will mean that uh, that the capacity should go back up again. In uh, in fact, there, he was going up there now. Yes, uh, follow him on his merry way. Uh, yeah. So uh, as we introduce these guys, the uh, the production capacity of the uh, of the raw materials should head back up in the right direction again. At least that's my hope. My, my very sincere hope. Go, he's going to replace himself. Pronto, there we go. So now that that's done, we turn vehicle replacement back off again, set it back to 100% just to be on the safe side. There we go, three vehicles done. You know what I've got to do next? Yep, that's right, I've got to go and do everything else. So that's the, the fundamental of... Uh, of keeping your upgrades under control. Upgrade everyone at the same time, and it just makes life better. In fact, we're gonna watch this guy as he passes his uh, truck mate, air horns. Yeah, I mean, it's only carrying eight coal. It'd be nice if it was carrying a little more than that, but it means that every vehicle, now that they're spaced out, every vehicle should be able to carry uh, a much higher number than they were doing before, and they move faster. So we should see some increased profit. I need to f look at this. He's having to slow down to 20 kilometers an hour to take some of these corners. I'm definitely going to start relaying roads in the near future. So uh, while I'm offline, I'll uh, uh, I'll replace all the other vehicles, um, get them all up to date. I'm going to slow it back down again, and uh, and that will be good. Right. Okay. To finish off, let's go watch some uh, some Metro liners in action. And uh, Maryport's a good place for that. Uh, Maryport is now a complete, completely different environment, frankly, because uh, it's all covered in electrification. Oh, oh, I just missed a glorious passing shot there. That's a shame. So there we go. These um, uh, Alcos, these Alco PAs, they're not bad. Um, if it comes down to a choice between them and a 442, get one of those. Uh, I... I'm going to take back my whole wholehearted recommendation of the um, of the big boy, but only because they're uh, slow. Yeah, you know they top out at just over a hundred kilometres an hour, and uh, so that's uh, what are we talking in miles per hour? Probably seventy miles per hour. Um, uh, yeah, I know a hundred kilometres an hour is sixty, but they're just over that. All right, so I've rounded. Uh, yeah, these guys, however, are capable of 200 kilometers an hour, even though they only carry 81. You don't have a choice. 81 or nothing. Um, they are the way of the future. So there we go. You know, electrification. We're, we're bang up to the modern age while still running steam. We're running steam and electric at the same time. 
Uh, in Europe, that's not unusual because of the crocodile, but uh, but in the US, it, that it seems a little bit more anachronistic. Uh, anyway, that will wrap it up for this time. In the next video, we're going to make progress. In fact, what I'll probably do is, because you already saw me do the, uh, the Loftus loop, I'll get at least some of that done ahead of time so that you're not watching a repeat. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm going to see if we can get Loftus running as well. I'm still not certain about loop versus point-to-point -point services, but I think overall I'm still in favour of trying the loop, trying to get loops working. Um, so actually, leave me a comment. Let me know. Would you rather see the Loftus loop happening or some roads being relayed in a straight line? I know, they both sound fascinating, don't they? Uh, thanks very much for watching today. Uh, I know it's been another revisionist episode, but I make the mistakes so you don't have to. Uh, thanks for watching. I've been Colonel Failure. Leave a like, subscribe if you've not done so already, and I'll catch up with you in the very near future. Cheerio. Thank <laughs> you.